thank you all very much for joining me today. Um, we're going to talk about home vegetable gardening and, and give you some ideas of some ways to get started, particularly if you're new to home vegetable gardening, and then also some tips to succeed. Um, I'll start and apologize for those of you who may have seen some speaking presentations that I've done before, um, or some of the Master Gardener presentations on home gardening. Some of these slides um, are ones that you have seen, but I've thrown a few new things in there, and uh, hopefully there's some new tips and new tidbits that you all can uh, uncover. So a little bit about me. Um, I've been a resident here since 1991 in the Raleigh area, um, but I am a Northern transplant. So um, I had to learn when I moved here first about all the Southern ways of gardening, what we do. Um, I've been a proud Arboretum men member since 1996. That's over 25 years of plant giveaways, uh, which is just wonderful. If you are not an Arboretum member, I encourage you to, to do it just even for the experience of a plant giveaway, uh, besides enjoying the Arboretum itself. Um, I have been community gardening since 2012 and been a master gardener since 2014. Um, I do focus a lot on community gardens. So, you know, you'll see slides and references that a lot of things I talk about or with respect to community gardens and home gardens, but, but I love community gardens because it's a way for us to share to a larger group besides ourselves. Um, but I have been playing in the dirt for almost 60 years, not quite. Um, and so I do love gardening. I've been gardening for, for quite a while um, and, and a variety of different things. Uh, constantly learning. Um, as, as Chris mentioned, I've, I've started an NC State horticulture certificate program. Anybody who wants to learn about um, a lot more about horticulture, they have a really great program over at NC State. And so uh, I'm an NC State student in addition to working full time uh, and I'm really loving the program. So. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about kind of the basics of home vegetable gardening. You know, where do you locate your garden? What types of vegetables should you use? I'm gonna spend a lot of time about that and uh, on soil preparation because I, we believe strongly as master gardeners, preparing your soil, getting a garden ready are some of the key things that you need to do for gardening pieces. Um, we'll talk about what to grow and when. Uh, I've got some really great references and I'll provide those to you in slides. Those people are in person. I've got some handouts here. Um, and I've got the URL links for most of the things that we're gonna talk about. Um, I'll talk quickly about common pests and disease and caring for the garden. We could have a whole one or two hour lecture on just diseases and pests. And we do, do have some of those recordings actually online. Uh, for some of the master gardener discussions. Um, and then we'll also talk about kind of other planting ideas and some other few things that, we're, that, that you can do in the gardening. So a lot of times we get the question of where can I put my garden? I'm in a shady area, I'm in a bright sunny area, I don't have any space. Um, there are some key requirements that when you look at a garden that you really need to do. You need to have for a lot of the warm season things, and we'll talk a little about cool season and warm season, but warm season crops, you really need to have at least six hours of sun, optimally eight to 10 hours of sunlight. Uh, I would highly rec recommend gardens that are close to where you're gonna be. So I see a lot of people that, or community gardens that have a community garden that's kind of way away from the building and way away from water. Um, that's typically gonna be a problem because if you wanna go out and pick something in the cold of the winter, um, or like this morning when it was 27 degrees out, you really wanna have things that are closer. I wanna go pick some herbs for a meal. I want it to be relatively close. Um, I want my water to be relatively close so I'm not running garden hoses and things across there. Uh, you wanna have good soil, well-drained soil, fertile soil. Now, a lot of people will talk a little bit about soil, but a lot of people talk about, well, my soil isn't very good. It's a lot of clay. Uh, clay is actually a very good soil. It just needs some amending. And we'll talk about how to do that uh, we highly recommend soil tests and, and we're exciting because April's almost here and soil tests become free again in the NC agronomic group and organization. Um, and as I said, water source is very critical. Uh, one of the things I wanted to show you on this particular picture, for a lot of people that say, well, I have trouble growing and, and they, they kind of go off and I'm like, well, this is a prime example. The, the NC um, North Carolina uh, Food Bank uh, Food Bank of Central and Eastern North Carolina has a community garden literally out in the middle of a parking lot. This garden was built, they took the asphalt off, they left the crush and run underneath. It's only got about three or four inches of soil before you hit almost solid rock. 
It's in a monstrously hot area, a massive amount of asphalt trucks all around it. The, the lady who runs this garden, Lourdes, is just amazing. She produced a huge amount. I think it was close to 70,000 pounds of food from her garden. And she's got a small farm on the side of it too, but she's done a wonderful job. I highly recommend if you want to go look at a garden as an exa example of what you can do, Food Bank Garden is great. They're always also looking for volunteers. Lourdes is great. So if you're ever interested in learning more, feel free to go and volunteer at the, the Food Bank Garden. But that's an example of you can grow anything anywhere if you see what she's done and how she's laid that out. So when we look at garden types, we always recommend if you're just getting started, start small. Don't plan on planting a five acre farm, start small, start with a few beds, start with some container gardens, and there's lots of options. You can have options for in-ground beds, you can do raised beds, Lots of different uh, models that are out there for raised bed, everything from treated lumber to corrugated metal, cinder blocks. Um, I've seen lots and lots of examples and a lot of the gardens I work with have different types of ones. You've got ones that are designed for more handicapped accessible gardens. Uh, there's lots of ways to do that. Container gardening is an, also a great way of starting. Got a lot of people that might be in an area where there's a lot of shade, Maybe your porch gets sunlight, but the rest of the, the, the yard doesn't get that. So containers is a great way to start. I'll show you some examples of containers, but some of the special things that you need to think about when you deal with container gardening. And obviously edible landscaping. Uh, again, we've got some great resources in this area that focus on edible landscaping and you know, changing the way you think of what your landscaping is. It doesn't have to be you know, general boxwoods um, and azaleas. You can have lots of other Lots of other edible landscaping options. So talking about container gardening, a great way for someone to get started in gardening. Um, large pots or even these examples of uh, uh, rain boots here that have got flowers in it. Lots of different ways that you can do it and you can mix and match different, um, different things, cool seasons and warm seasons, flowers and vegetable plants. Things that you've got to think about container gardening is drainage, making sure that those pots have got holes in it. Um, make sure that the pot is sized for what you need in terms of plant. So you don't want a really small pot if you're gonna be growing a large uh, uh, tomato. Be creative, uh, also dealing with soil and fertility. So containers will, will lose a lot of their nutrients faster. They can get hotter during the summertime and colder during the winter because they're elevated um, and they're not protected by ground or a, a, a raised bed. So you have to be careful of that when you're trying to grow different things. Here's some example of container sizes for things that you might want to grow. Uh, beans, cucumbers, eggplants, these are all great things that will grow in containers, but you have to look at the size of how big you think they're going to be. Tomatoes are wonderful. There are a bunch of varieties of tomatoes that are specifically designed to say, stay short. Uh, patio princess is one of them that I've seen that are only about three or four feet tall that work great in containers. Um, so you want to look at that. You want to look at those varieties and those types of plants that will um, do well in the container size that you're that you need. Vertical gardening is another option. People that are challenged in terms of I don't have a lot of space. Vertical gardening is a great way of being able to garden up versus having to garden out. Um, got some examples here, a couple from some of the community gardens over the second to the left on the upper portion is a bean teepee made from bamboo. Um, that's at one of the community gardens. I think that one's at the food bank. Um, the next one over there is another example of uh, at the food bank, actually. They've got a um, chain link fence and ugly separation where I park a lot of the trucks that are coming into and out of the food bank. They built a, a box container. Uh, made from recycled pallets, uh, Girl Scout built that, and then have a thornless blackberry that just runs along the entire length of the fence. A wonderful example of using plants and vegetables uh, and fruit in this case to beautify a, a structure that's there and to use and leverage that structure that's there. Um, lots of other ways of growing beans on trellises, tomatoes on trellises, uh, here's a, a squash also on the lower left-hand corner. 
uh, melon that's there that that has also grown vertically. So lots of options, uh, lots of ways to grow vertical uh, if you're challenged for space or if you have types of uh, growing like like a pole bean or other types of plants that need to grow upwards. When we look at gardening and we look at our, our planning, we, we really want to start with some kind of plan. Um, a lot of times if people are trying to plant the spring garden, I'm saying, hey, in the early parts of the winter when it's cold outside, be thinking about, start, be, start thinking about your garden. Think about what things you want, where you want to grow, use a plan and use that every season. So it also gives you then a historical record for you to be able to track what you grow. And it's really important uh, when we look at crop rotation to understand what things we grew in what spots over the past years. Uh, crop rotation is very, very important when we look at certain types and families and varieties of plants that carry the same diseases or that pull the same nutrients out of the soil. We want to avoid planting that same variety of plant, that same family in the same location year after year after year. Now, it becomes more of a challenge when you have a small garden or to say a single bed of how do you rotate those things in a small area, but it's definitely doable. So and examples include the fact that you can take tomatoes, say, on the west side of the warm season one year and the next year put them on, say, the east side or in the middle of the garden. So you can do crop rotation even on a small scale like this, uh, but this gives you a way of tracking and monitoring what you've got uh, and that documentation that you go back and look at year after year. So when we also look at gardens, we really encourage people to look at soil preparation. Um, I, I, I use this kind of as an example of, you know, you want to make yourself healthy, so you do good things to your body and to the things that you do uh, before you start adding a lot of things to it, right? We, or we go to the doctor to try, if we think we've got a, a, a malady or a problem, we go to the doctor to figure out what we need versus going right to the pharmacy and buying chemicals. Um, so, so having, preparing your soil, doing the due diligence of this, getting soil tests, we'll talk about that in a second, are very important because it allows you to know what, what your soil looks like, what your nutrients are, and what things you need to do. Um, a lot of times people talk about my soil is hard clay, it's rock hard. Yes, clay is very close particles, they're very close together, they hold a lot of moisture, so they can be very wet, but it also holds lots of nutrients. The big thing with clay is you need that compost, that organic matter mixed in with that clay to help break those clay soils up. It takes some time, but you can do things like mixed leaves and compost. Um, Composted manure, we always recommend that if you're gonna use manure that you compost it first. Don't put raw manure right in your garden. It can have uh, uh, pathogens. It can have uh, cause damage because it breaks down very, can cause damage to your plants. So we recommend composting that. Um, we also recommend during the winter time, if you're not doing a lot of gardening or if you have certain beds that you're not using, that you use cover crops, either that or even during the summertime. Uh, cover crops are very easy to use. So things like uh, annual ryegrass, um, Clemson clover, clover um, uh, buckwheat during the summertime for a warm season cover crop. Cover crops are really important because they will take nitrogen um, and, and pull it out of the air and fix it into the plant and into the soil. They provide a root structure. Uh, annual ryegrass does a huge amount of root structure. If you ever pull it up, there's usually a foot or so of roots there that help break that soil apart. And so those all get broken into the, uh, the soil and add much more nutrients automatically. Uh, mulch is another way of adding uh, nutrients into that soil and as well as it provides a moisture and temperature control that we recommend highly. So soil testing, um, why do soil testing? As I mentioned, a garden and, and understanding what your garden and your soil is like is very important. It's like going to the doctor before you go to the pharmacy instead of just buying things. Soil tests are, are wonderfully easy here in North Carolina. Starting in April, they will become free again. They are free from April through November for homeowners. Uh, if you're a farmer, they're, they are free all year. You can get them November through uh, March 
uh, at a cost. But what's nice is April is they become free again. So this is a soil test box. This is what they look like. Um, to become a master gardener, you have to figure out how to put them together. And it is a challenge. Um, I do not recommend putting tape. You get yelled at if you put tape on there. But pretty easy once you figure out how to get them together. Um, you'll need to fill this box up to the soil line. So you'll see that. Um, put your name and address. You can put a sample ID so um, you, I can identify where that sample came from if you have multiple garden beds. Um, this is also good for more than just gardening. So if you have blueberries that you planted, azaleas, if you have grass, different types of cool season, warm season grass, you should all do soil tests for all of those to know what your soil is like, how much, um, how many things you need in this soil. Yes, ma'am, that's a quick question. So what if you have more than one, like, like I have two and a half acres, do you need to do sure. different so, so people that have a large amount of property, and, and I've got three and a half acres, and I've got a pretty big lawn, I take samples in areas that are kind of the same, right? So like the front of my house is very shady. That's one area that I would take a sample of my lawn to test that there. I've got another section towards the side that's very wet and moist, shady and partly sunny. That's the kind of its own microclimate, its own area to grow. The back is bright and sunny. Um, I've got 16, 18 vegetable garden beds. Each one of my beds, I do a sample for each one of those beds. So it really does depend on kind of what you're going to grow. Um, it's very important also to, so if you're going to have like one section of that area, blueberry bushes all, that's going to be different soil requirements and different nutrient requirements than a vegetable garden or um, than a lawn would be. So Look at where what you're growing, look at what the climate areas are or areas are that you're growing and do those samples based on that. Um, there's no limit to the number of samples. You're, you, you can have you know boxes and boxes. I, I will, for most of my community gardens, we sample each bed. So you know 18, 20 boxes that were taken in at one time. Um, myself, again, I got 16 to 18 beds. I will do that, those samples, and I'll bring those all in in the springtime to get them done. Um, it's free from April to November. Yay. Free is good. Um, and, and if you need interpretation of the results, master gardeners are here to do that. One of the things that we do is get trained is how to read those results. And this is an example of the soil test report is they come back electronically um, and the uh, agronomic division puts that information out. You do have to put your email address in there to get access to it. But as master gardeners, we can get access to that. So if you have a question, you can call a master gardener office. They can pull up your soil test report if you know what your numbers are, and we can go that. But things that are very critical in those soil test reports are, um, first of all, what kind of crop you have growing. And that's one of the things on the form when you fill out, you put what your crop type is. And that helps identify when they do the soil test what the results are that come back. So it's, it's very important to put the, the crop type. Um, the key things that come back also are things like pH level, what they should be for that particular crop. So in this case, for vegetable garden, the optimal pH range is 6.2 to 6.7, right? It likes, veg, most vegetable gardens like to have a little more acidic. Uh, so if you remember your pH scale, seven is in the middle, higher numbers are alkali, lower numbers are acid, 6.2, 6.7 are is a little more acidic. That's the optimal range. This, this garden is, and test results 6.4, so it's very good from a pH. You don't need to do any adjustments on the pH. Um, they do have a recommendation on lime just to maybe raise that pH a little bit. Um, but in this case, it's very close. I'm not sure I would even necessarily do the lime. You also get the results for NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, when they do soil tests, they don't test for nitrogen. So a little misleading, they give you a recommendation, but they're not actually testing because nitrogen is very transient in the soil. It doesn't stay there for very long and it's very difficult to measure nitrogen, but they do phosphorus and potassium. And so you'll see those results there and also a recommendation on the amount of fertilizer and the type of fertilizer that you should use for this sample. In this case, they're recommending 20 zero, 0 so it's a high nitrogen with no phosphorus and no potassium because the phosphorus and potassium are off the scale. A lot of people get really nervous about, ooh, my phosphorus is really, really high. My potassium is really high. What do I need to do? You can't do anything on it. 
it's in the soil or it's in your water. It's in, it's in, if you're using a lot of compost, you'll see a lot of that also get very high scales. Um, what you want to do is avoid putting any type of fertilizer that has more, right? So don't put a 10, 10, 10 fertilizer on it. Don't put something that's got phosphorus. And that's why they're using 2100 in this case, because it's all nitrogen, no phosphorus and no potassium. And that's really what this is going to say. There are also on the bottom of the results, you also see some of what's called the micronutrients. These micronutrients are things like magnesium, zinc, copper, critical for plants to grow and plants to have to be able to absorb nutrients as they're growing, but not as critical for most home gardeners and most people, unless you're really, really tweaking um, some of your micronutrients. Um, if the values are very much off, there are things that you can do to add. Um, but that's, that's kind of the results. And again, a master gardener can help translate this and also try to figure out if I don't have a thousand square feet, but I've got a four by eight foot bed, how much fertilizer do I need, right? They, they said five pounds per thousand square feet, but I, we can help that. We can help do that math. Um, we were trained on how to do math. Uh, a lot of people ask me, well, so I did a soil test last year, but I added some compost and I got some new soil delivered. Um, or I got some new bags of soil, do I need to do another test? Well, our answer basically is yes. Anytime you make major changes to your garden and you've changed the soil, you should do another test or periodically every three years. If you're not doing a lot of changes, we recommend testing it every three years just because that allows you to validate your soil is still good and, and you haven't changed a lot as you planted things in there. Let's see, uh, lots of tons of information. If you end up needing more advanced soil or pathogen testing, the agronomic lab has lots and lots of different tests that are available, some they charge for, um, but there's a lot, of, a lot of great information out there. Um, and that location, by the way, is just right up the street from here, right across from the art museum on Reedy Creek Road. Um, you can take those soil tests and you can either drop them off at a master gardener office, uh, which is on the other side of Correa Drive, um, on the other side of town, or you can drop them right at the back on the loading dock uh, at the agronomic office off Reedy Creek Road. Uh, pretty easy to get to. Um, soil amending, a lot of times when you get these results back, you, you've got to decide, am I going to be organic or am I not going to be organic? Or am I going to be something in between? Um, I do a lot of community garden works where we're organic, um, not certified, but organic with a little asterisk, which says that there are times where we do need to do non-organic, use non-organic means to control certain things. I'm not gonna lose the entire garden because um, some of the organic controls are not as good as, as a non -or, or inorganic control. Look on, the, look on the bags, there's a lot of information on there. Again, the NPK, those numbers are actually the percentage of that particular element that's in there, the macronutrient. So 21% nitrogen in this case, 3% phosphorus, 20% potassium. Um, those are the percentages in the bag. The remainder of the bag is inert material that, that's just kind of binding it together. Um, when you apply fertilizer, um, you can apply when you're first planting, you can a side dress, you can apply over time. And we do recommend based on the recommendations that you do that over time. We, you don't put all of say all of the high nitrogen all at one time. You spread it out over a couple of months or your growing season. So talking about growing season, a lot of times you get a lot of people asking, hey, I wanna to plant tomatoes. 80 degrees three weeks ago, it was wonderful, gorgeous. Everybody was out going around, everybody's running off to the home, you know, the big box stores to go and buy their plants and start planting tomatoes and peppers. Not yet, 27 degrees this morning in my house. Uh, and, and everything in my garden was all covered up. I have no tomatoes, no warm season stuff outside. April 15th, is typically the day we use as the last frost date. So the two bookends, tax day and Halloween, that's our warm season growing here in this part of central North Carolina. So if we, don't, we don't look at putting anything out until really mid-April. Things like peppers and other plants really towards the end of April because they like nice warm soil. If you measure your soil temperature outside today, it's probably closer to 40 degrees not gonna be really good for them to grow. They'll be there, but they're gonna have much more problems until that soil gets warmer, the end of April, beginning of May here. Last frost date, October 31st. Now we'll say with a caveat here is, 
we are seeing both of these days get pushed to the left and to the right. Earlier, last frost dates, later, first frost dates. Last year, I think our first frost here was somewhere around early, the first or second week in November. So you do have to watch the calendar, watch what's out there. Um, we did have last year an, a late frost, the about the 14th of April. So you do need to watch for that. Uh, we got all nervous last year because it was going to be below freezing. We covered everything up because we'd gotten it in on April 10th. That stuff was outside and jeopardized. Um, and tomatoes and peppers, those plants will die. Uh, I had some actually in my garage, thought it was going to be warm enough in an unheated garage, 22 degrees, two weekends ago, lost a whole bunch of tom tomato seedlings. Um, so you just need to watch, but this is the typical book benchmarks. Another key thing is what we call a common crop chart. And you'll see this, um, I've got a reference on one of the slides for the URL uh, for where this is available, but it's available here. It's a wonderful reference created by NC State and Master Gardeners that have two sides to it, a cool season and a warm season. And this is for Central North Carolina. So if you're in the mountains watching this or you're on the coast, your seasons are gonna be a little different. But what's wonderful about it is it, it answers a lot of the questions that we get all the time about home gardening. What should I grow? What varieties should I grow? When do I plant it? Should I buy it seeds or should I buy it as transplants? Start out with when to grow. This case, this is a warm season chart and we're starting to get towards warm seasons. You see in this chart, there's really two planting windows. In some cases, you can plant things for your summertime garden starting in April, but there's also another window where you can plant in August and get a fall season from those warm season crops. So we are fortunate here in North Carolina, for example, we can grow tomatoes. Um, this one says only one, actually no, it's all the way from, from uh, April through uh, August timeframe, but we can really grow two seasons. One we plant early and we can harvest in July. The next one we can plant in June and July and harvest all the way in through September until the first frost. But you see that a lot with um, uh, some of these things here in North Carolina. We've got two seasons to grow. Cool season plants, very similar. So we still can grow cool season. Cool season are what we grow in right now. And those are things like lettuces, chards, kales, onions, garlics, potatoes, all of those things. We actually, many of them can still be planted outside given that we have cool weather. They do very well in cool weather. They are gonna start having more problems in the late April, May, June timeframe when we start getting warmer. Those plants are designed not to like the warm temperature. They're gonna to go to seed or go bolt. Um, so they will be limited to the early springtime, but they too, and many of them have growing seasons both in the spring and in the fall. So you'll see two sets where you can plant things in the spring, plant things in the fall. Um, in the fall, again, we in our area, because it's getting a little warmer, can grow things really here all season long. I grow lettuce, I grow chard, I grow kale uh, all season long. I've been picking lettuce. Granted, it's not gonna grow very fast in the middle, dead of winter, but I've been picking lettuce basically since September timeframe and I'll pick it until, until June timeframe. All right, so other things on this chart that I wanted to go through very quickly, there's a column that talks about family plant, uh, our, our plant family, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Seeds are transplants. Um, a lot of times we get, well, you know, should I buy seeds? Should I do transplants? Um, there's some great references about here, whether they do well as seeds or transplants. Generally, certain things uh, and plants that grow and germinate very quickly, you wanna do via seed. Any types of root crops like um, onions, uh, you also definitely want to do, uh, and carrots you wanna do via seed or via a, a bulb, or uh, uh, sometimes you can do via plants or a tuber. Things that grow with transplants, I typically recommend when they are things that you need to grow quickly to take a long time to grow from the time they see to the time they produce fruits. So things like peppers, tomatoes, those I grow almost always via transplants. Now I grow a lot of those via seeds starting back in January and February when it's cold outside and I dream about gardening, I'll, I'll start planting on the inside. I grow them inside. My wife yells about all of the plants I have all over upstairs and in the garage. 
But, but you can grow those from seeds. And I grow a lot from seeds because I like the varieties that I can choose. Not as much selection if you're buying transplants, if you got to buy that. Um, but, but we'll talk a little bit about that. Then this other column here talks about days to maturity. So we have both a column that says the seed time for maturity and transplant. And you can see the difference, particularly if you look at some of these warm seasons. So if you grow things like tomatoes from seed, it's you know 135 days to go from seed to a plant harvest versus 75 days. So a little over a month or three months to, to get there versus almost four or five months to get there. So that's kind of in your decision. Other things in this chart that you can see are the footprint. So how big does that gr uh, plant grow? These are really important to decide if you have limited space, how many tomatoes should I really put in my bed? Tomatoes are gonna grow big. Um, they're gonna grow 12 foot or 12 inches by 12 inches or, or 24 inches by 24 inches. They're gonna get very large. You need to make sure you plan that out. We've also got vertical support, whether they can handle some shade and you'll see a lot of the winter time, cool season crops can do better in the shade as well as a column called succession planting. Succession planting is where I plant um, one small um, batch of say radishes this week, and then I'll plant another, another two weeks from now and another two weeks from now so that I get a harvest over time. Not, all, not that whole row of, of radishes all at one time so that I have 500 radishes that I can't use up all at one time. I spread it out. Okay, footprints again, really critical. We talked a little bit about that. When you buy the tomato plants in a store and it's in a, in a four inch round pot, it's great. It's small, it's this big, but you gotta realize it's gonna get this big around. It's gonna get six feet tall. So you've got to plan for that depending on how, um, how much space your, your, your particular vegetable is gonna need. Um, plant families, again, I talked a little bit about that, but it's really, really important because it tells you what varieties of family that plant is from. And you want to talk, when we talk about rotation, you wanna move those plants, not in the same area from year to year to year. Um, so we really need to understand that. Uh, this is the reference to the common crop chart, and you'll see that pages 16 and 17 in the Ready Garden Grow handbook, which is a handbook that Master Gardeners created for a class called Ready Garden Grow. Some of those classes are online. I think I've got some of the videos towards the end uh, in terms of references. Um, what grows well? These are, these are some of the things that, that will, you know, when people ask me, well, what, I, what, what should I start with? These are things that I would definitely start with. Beans, cucumbers, eggplants and peppers, um, squash and zucchini, maybe. Tomatoes also, maybe. They can be more challenging. Um, we've got a couple of diseases. We'll talk a little about some of the pests associated with that. But cool seasons are great because very few things, uh, insects and diseases are out uh, during, the, during the cool of the season. As it starts getting warmer, you see a lot more. But things like cabbage collards, kale, Swiss chards grow great here in North Carolina during the cool seasons. They're wonderfully healthy for you. Um, spinach and radishes are super easy. Radishes germinate in just a few days. Um, it's super easy to grow. Plant families, these are the different plant families that are out there. And we've already talked about a bunch of them, but some of the things that are important to know are things like nightshades are your tomatoes, eggplants, and peppers. They are one family and they will pull the same nutrients out of the soil for all those families. So if you plant tomatoes and peppers in the same spot year after year, they're pulling the same nutrients out. They also carry the same diseases. So you'll see a lot of the same soil-borne diseases in those plants of that same family. That's the reason why you want to move them around in your garden to avoid pulling the same nutrients out as well as the same disease problem. So mix your, mix your families in as you're growing. Here's a little about crop rotation. I alluded to this earlier, but this is an example of one where, you know, it's a four-year rotation where you small bed and you rotate your crops around. Um, and, and run, rotate them from the different seasons too. But just an example of how you can change, change up what you're growing from one to the other. Method of planting, um, again, lots of ways you can do different types of planting. You can start with seeds indoors like I do. You can, you can do direct planting and there are some, um, per the chart, there are some things that do well. So even things like cucumbers, I do see people buying transplanted cucumbers. I'm like, why? They're so easy to plant with seed. They germinate very quickly. Um, they usually have usually a pretty good high germination rate. 
Um, typically not something I would plant in a, in a, at a, as a transplant, I would plant directly as a seed. Um, you definitely have to think about purchasing transplants. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a second, but some of the vegetables are best grown that, that are ones that are easy to plant, like things like radishes, any kind of root crops. Um, you want to look at fresh seeds. So we'll talk in a second. I've got a slide about that. Uh, this is just an example of a typical seed growth um, of how it grows from the very plant. One thing on this chart to notice is that seed depth that you plant seeds in, people have a tendency to make a nice deep row and plant their seeds three or four inches down in the ground. That's really a problem. These seeds are basically an embryo with a picnic basket. They have a limited amount of energy that they, they have available to grow from the seed to the first sets of leaves so that photosynthesis and the first sets of roots that can start process is done. You really wanna can't plant them shallower than you think. Only one to two times, I've seen three to four times, one to two of the maximum seed height or diameter. So things like lettuce seeds are really, really small. Those are almost right on the surface, barely covered with soil. Other larger seeds like squashes, uh, melons can go a little bit deeper but really not very deep. You know, one to two times the size of the seed is as steep as you should plant them. Um, here's again, uh, information about the seed. Do look at the seed packs. There's a ton of information on them, including the sell by date. You wanna use as fresh seeds as possible. Some seeds do better in storage. So bigger seeds that are harder, things like peppers and tomatoes can do better in storage. So I will save them potentially from year to year. Things like lettuce, really small, thin seeds, I don't save because it's not worth their germination rate drops drastically. Doug here at the Arboretum did a great presentation on growing seeds. This is the YouTube link. Go out onto the Arboretum site, take a look at that. It's got a, got a great presentation about different things with growing seeds. It was a wonderful job. Um, great information on it. Transplants. So when I look at transplants, and again, a lot of people are transplants, particularly if you're only growing a few things, transplants are a great way to start. If I'm growing a container, I only have to go out and buy one tomato plant or one or two pepper plants. Um, look at plants that are not bearing fruit. Everybody's excited. I get a little tiny tomato plant and there's already flowers and fruit on it. No, no, no. You want them without the flowers and fruit. You want them to grow, start small, but grow big, then get your flowers and fruit. Um, so we want to do that. You want to make sure you're hard in these transplants. Although these plants may have been sitting outside or maybe in a covered greenhouse area, they really may not have, been, have hardened. And hardening is the idea of taking your plant and giving it some time to get used to being outside. If, if the plant is inside right now, it's not used to the sunlight. It's not used to the cold. It's not used to the hot. It's not used to the wind to the dryness that's outside or the wetness that's outside. So you take them out for a day, half a day, and you bring them back. And you take them out for two days and you bring them out. Second thing about taking your plants out for a walk, it's kind of what you're doing. You're taking them outside, getting them used to being outside such that a point where they're outside full time before you transplant them in the garden, they'll be much stronger, much healthier, much more ready and going to less shock than when you plant them. Um, Try to plant on a cloudy day that's not so hot, not so windy. Um, dig a hole large enough. Look for ones that are not root bound. A lot of times you will see these seedlings, these transplants come in and they've got massive root structure in the plastic box. So the roots are trying to go out, they hit the plastic container and they kind of go in a circle. You wanna break some of those roots a little bit apart before you put them in the ground to stop that circular rotation so that the roots start going out and going down so that when they get planted, they, they, they grow correctly. Um, you can use a little bit of starter fertilizer and you do wanna protect those plants from the elements as much as you can because they're gonna go into some kind of shock when you first put them in. Again, if they're outside, it's, it, they've been hardened, but they may not be really hardened enough. So give them some time, plant them in a, in a kind of a nicer day or give them a little bit of cover until they get used to being outdoors full time. Planting tomatoes, a little different. Um, tomatoes have a, a unique property called adventitious roots that along the stalk of the tomato, you see these little white bumps. Those are roots that are, are ready to grow. So if you get a lot of times tomatoes, particularly as they're later transplants, they'll be very tall and leggy. You can remove all but the first few top sets of leaves 
plant that entire plant either straight down into a hole, except for those top sets of leaves, or I've even planted some sideways and slightly tilted them upwards. So that whole stalk becomes now a strong root structure, all of those adventitious roots grow out and it becomes a very strong tomato plant, stronger than it would if you just planted it straight and let it kind of flop around. Springtime gardening, a um, lot of different options for the springtime. And again, we're growing this right now. So we've got a, a lot of different things that we've got, kale and spinach um, uh, growing in my garden, Swiss chard. I've, I've had kale really again from the fall um, it's actually starting to get warm for the kale. But spinach grows really well. Most of these are direct seed or from seedlings. Uh, you can plant February and March. Summertime gardens like peppers and tomatoes, warm season crops. Again, not till April, sometimes May, going in through uh, September and August timeframe. You can buy or grow transplants or grow them ahead like I do. Uh, there's lots of ways that you can get that done. But a lot of times these are going to do better with transplant just because there's a shorter growing time from a transplant. Other things in the summer garden include pole beans and cucumbers, uh, squash and corn. Um, I get a lot of people ask about corn, and I, I personally don't recommend corn because corn does two things. One, you have to have a large variety of corn for the corn to pollinate. Second of all, corn um, is very it's not pest resistant in most cases. So you're gonna have corn worms, you're gonna have a lot of other things on the corn um, that just take a lot more chemicals and a lot more um, work and maintenance than corn I think is worth. But there's some people that like to grow it, but you'll have to have a fairly large um, stand of corn in order to be able to get it because the corn pollinates itself. Um, these I grow typically May through to August timeframe and typically these are direct seeded Again, cucumbers and squash germinate very quickly and very easily, pole beans. Again, I don't grow, grow via transplant because they grow very well with seeds. Fall, wintertime gardening, it's very similar to the springtime stuff. Uh, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, kales, carrots, all of these can be both, both springtime and fall, winter. When we plant things, irrigation is very critical. Uh, most of these veg vegetables require one inches of water a week, uh, particularly when they are new. Again, they're going into shock right away. They've been inside nice and great. They've been watching them and watering them. Now they're outside. It's much hotter, drier, or wetter. You need to watch the soil level uh, and, and the water level for that. Um, better to water longer and uh, fewer waterings. That gives more moisture down into the roots. You do also want to make sure you... Um, water down into the roots. Weeds compete with plants in a number of ways. It competes for nutrients, water, soil, uh, nutrients, and sunlight. So try to keep the weeds ahead. Um, a lot of different ways that you can do that and including minimizing soil tilling, which brings a lot of weeds up to the surface if you, they, they've gotten down underneath. Um, do watch using herbicides around uh, plants because a lot of plants are very sensitive to herbicides. Uh, we've had some cases in some of the community gardens where um, spray over from spraying lawn with some herbicides, uh, herb, uh, weed control has sprayed into the air and damaged some of the tomato and pepper plants. So that's always a possibility. You need to watch for that. Um, using mulch, use mulch where you can to help control the weeds, keep the weeds down. I do in my garden quite frequently. Um, I use newspaper mulch and we'll use wood chips in some cases to help control those weeds. Uh, that, that helps me keep, keep them at bay. And I don't like weeding. Weeding is not my fun part of gardening. So let's go on to pests and diseases. Uh, a little bit about things. The number one thing is to keep your plants healthy. So if you have a real good soil, you've got the right nutrients, you've got healthy plants that you put in, that helps a lot minimize your pest and disease problems. Um, rotating crops also is another great way of trying to minimize the problems that would exist in one family from year to year to year if you plant the same thing in the same location. Uh, you wanna to try to attract beneficial insects. So things like flowers will attract good insects and um, having a, a good environment also will attract insects that are good insects in addition to bad insects. If you need controls, Organic controls are usually preferred. There are, again, some cases where organic controls don't do well, particularly things like funguses. Organic controls are not as good. 
Um, we have a process called integrated pest management, and we've got a number of other lectures and topics on integrated pest management that we can go and talk about that. But it's basically the idea of monitoring your garden, looking for problems in the garden. When you see a problem, do something about that problem that's a minimal amount of uh, control. See if that has an effect. If it doesn't, then you do a greater control until, until you resolve your problem. So it's a whole integrated pest management of monitoring and applying controls to that garden based on a minimal amount of, of control that you need. Uh, and that means chemical or other types of controls. And you can certainly contact Master Gardeners for help. We are there, we've got about 193 Master Gardeners that are available to help people. Uh, and, and this, take a picture of what your problem is, send it as an email with a picture attachment. Master Gardeners can look at it either via email um, and I'll talk a little about how other ways to contact us. Common pests and diseases, and I want to go through these very quickly. Uh, things that you'll see is tomato hornworms, uh, really easy to find on tomatoes. Uh, basically, the stalk looks completely stripped of leaves. There's a tomato hornworm more than likely around and available. This one's really cool because this picture shows a tomato hornworm uh, with a parasitic wasp larva on it. Um, that guy's already dead. The wasp has laid its eggs inside and they've already gum through that, uh, that, that worm and they are about ready to hatch and then become more parasitic wasp. Again, a good, a good insect that you want in your garden. Tomato hornworm is dead, but you can look for them and you can, you can kill them. This guy's pretty much already dead because he's already been kind of chumped on. Um, squash vine borer is really tough. So squashes, zucchinis have a problem with a, with a moth that lays its eggs in the soil and the larva bores up through the vine. And basically one day you have a beautiful squash plant and the next day it's completely collapsed. Um, no control for it. There's no chemical control for it. Uh, there, are, there are ways that you can use row covers that protect the plants early on and keep the moth from planting its, if its eggs are not already in the soil, planting them in the soil, um, you can, do succession planting on squashes and zucchinis so that you may break the cycle of the squash vine borer larva harvesting. Um, you can physically remove the, the, um, the, the larva that's in there by cutting up the stalk and removing it or using, I've seen people go up and use like a coat hanger hook to try to get to it and get it out and then try to cover up the plant and get it to grow. But, but really succession planting, multiple plantings is kind of the best way we do it or with row covers. You will have to remove the covers once they start flowering because otherwise the flowers won't be pollinated. But it's a tough, it's a tough pest uh, to deal with because we really don't have a control for it. Other pests that we see here in Central North Carolina, squash bugs, you'll see these little brown clusters of eggs or orangey or brownish uh, or um, uh, gold colored ones, they can be easily removed and they can be squashed uh, in terms of physically. Um, you can use uh, some things like oils and things to control that. Uh, aphids are another one you'll see on the bottom, little, little green insects on the bottom of leaves. They typically won't kill the plant, but they can cause damage to the plant um, and make it weaker. You may see black sooty mold on there uh, in as called honeydew. Um, they can use, also, you can use water to spray off aphids. You can use insecticidal soap or neem oil, which basically coats the insect and uh, makes it suffocate. Uh, also, natural um, ladybird beetles or ladybugs uh, love aphids. So if you've got a good garden, ladybugs will probably come in, take a look at it. A lot of times I get questions, well, should I go out and buy ladybugs? Yeah, you can do that, but they're only going to be there for as long as the food supply is there. As soon as the aphids are gone, they're out of there. So really better having a healthy garden that attracts good insects like ladybugs, and they will um, and they will come and keep your aphid population under control. Vegetable diseases, common ones we see, early blight, um, uh, and, and some blossom end rot, upper, upper left-hand corner is blossom end rot. Blossom end rot is a lack of calcium uptake in the soil. And again, that's something that you can look at your soil results and see some of that. Um, constant moisture is a very key thing for uptake of calcium, a consistent level of moisture. It is kind of tougher here in North Carolina because we get afternoons during the summertime that rain very heavily. So we get a lot of inconsistent moisture. Um, remove the fruits that's damaged, that, that, um, that's already no good fruit. 
Blights, early blights, late blights, you'll see that a lot. Um, these are also soil-borne diseases. One of the things we do on tomatoes is we typically will remove the upper eight to 12 inches of leaves on a tomato plant. That keeps a lot of the soil diseases like the blights that, that can get um, from the soil to the plant that splash up when it rains. Uh, by, by removing those sets of leaves, we kind of help that. When you do get um, contaminated crops or crops that are get blight related, um, don't compost them, throw those out. So don't add that back into your compost. And crop rotation is very critical. You can also look for tomato varieties that are more resistant to some of these diseases. Um, and here's some examples, uh, Fusarium or verticulum wilt, that you look for plants that have a VNF, uh, or sorry, VFN uh, and N being nematode resistance. So these are varieties that do better uh, preventing this type of disease. Powdery mildew, you'll see a lot on the, the cucumbers, squashes. Uh, consistent watering, again, is pretty critical. Once you start seeing it, most of the fungicides aren't gonna be very uh, effective on doing it, um, but do do plant rotation. To keep your plants spaced out is another key piece for controlling powdery mildew um, and do dispose of plants that are infected, again, not composting it. So a lot of times you get questions, particularly here in the early season, how can I extend my season? How do I grow things during the winter time? Like I grow lettuce and things. I use hoops in my garden pretty consistently. Um, I have my plants covered this morning when it was 27 degrees, even though they're cool season crops, a lot of the cabbages and kales and lettuces are new. I wanted to protect them against this cold that we got last night. So we use hoops, very simple, lots of options available. Some that are PVC based. Um, these middle ones at the bottom here are some of the political sign um, metal pieces that, that are used. Don't steal political signs from your neighbors until after the, the voting seasons. Uh, others are conduit. Uh, this is a metal conduit, half inch conduit that's bent into a hoop, very strong uh, with a plastic clip on it. Using a row cover, this is spun fabric that I use. Um, lots of different options and available in terms of different thicknesses and different weights. So a lot of different ways to, to provide warmth and protection there. Also this row cover, if they're thinner ones, can be used, again, as we used for protecting against insect, um, another way of doing it. And it provides some shade as you plant. I use it a lot of times also to provide some sort of shade. Uh, for my plants when they're young and when they're getting in, or if I'm trying to plant in the fall and it's still really warm out towards the end of August or early September, I may use that also as a shade cloth mechanism. Also recommend adding flowers to your garden. Flowers, besides being beautiful, do attract pollinators. So look at native flowers, look at flowers that, um, that will attract pollinators or other, other birds. Sunflowers are wonderful attracting birds that may also come and eat some of your insects in it. So I use flowers all over on the various ends of my bed um, to try to pull, pull insects, good insects into, into the garden. A little bit about my favorite picks. So when I look at cool season, um, things like cilantro I love because cilantro, contrary to what people think, um, a lot of times it's used in Asian uh, and also Mexican uh, cooking uh, as an herb. Um, it's actually a cool season crop. So it grows really well during the winter time. Right now, as it's starting to get warm, cilantro starts bolting. So it's gonna have more of a problem when it gets warmer out. It's really cool because it's both an herb and a spice. The leaves are the herb portion. The cilantro, when it goes to seed, is coriander. So those little round coriander pieces come out of the slanto pro. So it's cool. It's, it's got both, both pieces. Saffron crocus is my kind of next favorite wintertime plant uh, because it's a beautiful purple flowering fall crocus that you pull the stamen out of that, that the very, the red pieces that are in the middle. And those are the saffron threads that are somewhere around $500 an ounce. Um, it's, it's because they all have to be handpicked. So very, very cool. Grow well in our area. Um, if you can keep the voles away from them, they, they do well, really well and, and will propagate and split bulb split a lot. So you can give them to your friends and neighbors. Summertime, uh, crops, uh, zebra tomato is one of my favorite tomatoes because it's very colorful. 
does have a pretty bad problem with blossom end rot. It's a pretty big calcium feeder, so it it does. I do get blossom end rot on it. Sunflowers, giant sunflowers, and this is one of my master guard or one of my gardener friends in one of the community gardens. Seeing, you know, a twelve foot tall sunflower is really pretty cool. Um, kids love it. It's really beautiful. But my all time favorite plant is what's called a fish pepper. This pepper is um, is a Caribbean based pepper. It's fairly mild, so milder than a jalapeno is. Totally cool plant because the leaves themselves are variegated. The, the fruit itself starts out in a green state, goes green and yellow striped, yellow, yellow and orange striped, orange and red striped, and then all red. And you kind of see a mix of that in this picture, some over on the very right-hand side, some of the green and yellow stage, some that are, 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 are orange and red striped. Very, very cool plant, very good to grow, um, pretty pretty good producer, um, and a pretty mild pepper. Uh, used in a lot of, uh, of dishes that uh, in their kind of yellow stage uh, for, for cooking for a fish. It came, it came from a fish sauce, a spicy fish sauce. So closing uh, comments, we've got some references here. Uh, this is the Wake County Master Gardener homepage. Uh, we've got a lot of good information and you can can get information there. We have a whole bunch of Ready Garden Grow YouTube recordings. So this was a series very similar to this one, but more in depth and on specific topics also that the Master Gardeners did with Wake County Libraries. Um, and we'll have that, se that series again, both in person and online. Uh, but this is a recordings for them, for the, those we've done over the past years. Home Vegetable Gardening Quick Reference Guide is also there. And I've got a few of those handouts up here. There's a reference to the soil testing uh, for, for North Carolina agronomic. Uh, this is the fall or the planting schedule there. And uh, insect pest diseases are also listed there as another reference from an NC State publication. So contact for us, uh, we are located, we have a physical office and we actually have people manned there Monday through Friday, uh, nine to 12 and one to four. Uh, we do have a phone number you can call um, that'll hit there. And if there's nobody in the office, they'll hit voicemail that someone will get to. Email address, Twitter, Twitter Facebook, lots of web. Uh, please also join our Facebook page. We put a lot of information out on Facebook out there. Um, you can mail us, you can stop by, you can call us, lots of ways to get hold of us. And again, 193 Master Gardeners back there behind you, volunteers that are there to support you. And, and that's it. What kind of questions do we have? Thank you so much, Rich. We did have an online question, and I think you referenced it with the URL. So you were looking for that guide to the planting dates. Which one was that one? Was that the third one? Okay. Um, let's see. So there's two references. There is some annual calendar on this reference, uh, which is a- oh, there you go. So the second to the last one? Second to the last one. Okay. Um, the other one, our common crop chart, yeah, that's the one they were looking for. Yeah, so that one should be, oh, right back there. It's called Common Crop Chart. It's, oh, there in, you go. it's in the Ready Garden Grow uh, Handbook, which is a free handbook that's available um, out there on page 16 and 17. Um, the other thing that I did not have here, and had someone sent me a note, thank you very much. Um, there is also online Extension Gardener, uh, Extension Master Gardener Handbook. Uh, it's put out by NCSU Press. Um, I think, or maybe it's UNC Press. It's NCSU, but there is an edition available and um, it's both hard copy and it's completely online. So the same book that we go through with all of the chapters so as a Master Gardener we get trained on is available for anybody available online. I did not put the reference there, but if you do a URL, look up Extension Gardener Handbook, uh, North Carolina, you should be able to find that reference there. So Rich, you also inspired someone. They would like to know where to get the fish pepper. Um, so that's a good question. Um, there are, it's not readily available, although I actually did see one in one local nursery. Um, I don't know where, and I haven't seen one recently, but I would do a, a search online for fish pepper seeds. And um, there's a number of different sources I've seen available. Uh, some of the bigger seed distributors got it, but there's some also some specialty. There was one person down in Florida 
that specialized in hot peppers and peppers. It's common, that's a mo much more commonly available. Um, uh, but if you, don't, if you don't get any reference to that, let me know and you can reach out to me through the Master Gardeners and I can get you some seeds, so. Okay, thank you. And, oh, we just lost the question. Let me see if I can go back to it. Oh, it was about cover crops, Rich. Okay. And I just have to get to my uh, questions because they're coming in and I had it highlighted. I have a question. Yes, ma'am, go ahead. There we go. Uh, since uh, blueberries are acid soil, are there any companion vegetables that will grow with that? Um, well, some things like tomatoes and pepper like more acidic. Um, typically not as much as blueberries get. Um, I, I would stay away from planting a lot of plants around blueberries. Um, they've got, I think, a fairly shallow root structure. I don't want to be competing with that. Um, and blueberries will get very, very large. I mean, we used to be buy them, they're, they're small. But I had a neighbor who had blueberry bushes for 40 plus years where she lived. And they were like 12 feet tall and you know 15 feet around and she had a cluster that was about a half the size of this room which was amazing the amount of blueberries that she got but they do really well they're very acidic um you may need to put so when you do soil test for that you may come back with your soil being too alkali well, mine has been established for 15 years. yeah and that's fine mixing leaf compost and things like that will raise or lower that ph so it'll make it more acidic there are some fertilizers that will will add uh, acid into that. Um, you can do sulfur as an organic element to add and, and to lower the pH. Um, I have actually very alkali soil in my garden, so I am constantly having to add some um, acid, but you have to be very careful, follow the manufacturer's directions, but be very careful with things like sulfur. It can burn your plants. So I just use it sparingly to lower that pH. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a follow-up blueberry question. Mm -hmm. and that is, um, I can't ever get any Sure. So this year I want to try to do some sort of panels around it. Right. If I use one inch chicken wire, will birds, will little birds still be able to get through that? Um, can you repeat yeah. the question for the online folks, Rich? Hmm? Can you repeat the question for the oh, online yeah, sorry, folks? Sorry, sorry. So, the, so the question the was regarding blueberries. Um, blueberries do well here in North Carolina. Actually, there's, if you do, again, another Google search for blueberries, um, North Carolina, NC State publications. There's some great publications about growing blueberries, what varieties do well, how to prune them. Um, but they do, you do have to defend them against a lot of other pests, particularly birds. Um, yeah, netting can be a problem because it will catch birds. And I know some people that have had problems with that. Um, uh, so a chicken wire might be fine. You may get some really small birds that might try to get in there. Um, I do know one community garden in Beltline in Raleigh, they've basically built a caged fenced area for all of their blueberries and blackberries to try to protect them. Um, so they built like a, an eight foot tall, but they've got a large cluster of blueberries and blackberries. And are blueberries pollinated by insects, I presume? Um, they are pollinated by insects, yeah. Yeah, you don't want it so small that you're gonna block the insects and, and pollinators for them. I also am concerned. I don't want space or anything to get caught. Sure. In it. So that's why I was wondering with, with one-inch chicken wire. It, it, it might be okay. I, you know, again, I personally don't know. Uh, my blueberries that I'm growing are not that big enough that, um, and I'm willing to share a little bit with my, my nature and with friends. I know most of the deer don't share with me. So uh, those, those I do keep out, but um, I mean, you can try it. I have never seen anything that talk about what's a good size for that, for blueberry netting and things. Uh, and I don't, I don't know if there is a good answer for that, but I don't personally have that. Um, what you could do would recommend is a great example, email master gardeners, see if there's any other references that they have. Um, I don't remember in any of the NC state publications them talking about specific netting size or things like that to keep animals out. So but it's not sort of NC State that specializes in blueberries, so we should be able to get that in the Yeah, yeah, you ask ask this. Yeah, for ask the mask of barters for information. And if they don't have anything, they can we can so we have access to all of the university resources. If we can't get an answer, we can reach out to professors or specialists 
um, that, that can get us answers for that to try to get it back to you. So, all right, Chris, you said, do you got any yep, other? Yep, they just went off the screen. So but here it is again. Ruth was wondering, how do you handle the cover crops in the spring when you're ready to plant vegetables? What do sure. you do with them? Good question, because if you grow annual ryegrass, this time of year, it's normally about a foot tall and it's really lush, beautiful and green. But what do you do with it? So a couple of things that I do is if it's really tall, I will mow it down and then turn it over. Um, and I typically prepare my beds. So if I'm looking at planting mid-April, um, I started about three, four weeks ago preparing all of my beds. I've, I've turned over those cover crops. Um, I actually had some additional soil. So I put soil right on top of it and that will kill that those plants. I, I've turned over those beds to, to try to take that cover crop um, and break it down into the soil. Now, again, I'm minimizing as much as I want to, don't want to, to till that soil up so much so that I'm trying to bring those weeds from underneath the soil in. But I, I do try to get rid of that. Um, they will eventually die. Annual ryegrass doesn't like warm temperatures. So uh, you'll see them die out eventually. Uh, things like clover, you want to make sure you do turn that. If you're using crimson clover, you want to turn that over so it goes before you get to seed. Otherwise, you're going to get more clover in your garden as it propagates through the season. Um, but, but basically, I'm preparing those beds now so they're ready for my planting come April in about two or three weeks. So you probably don't want to wait for them to die naturally because that could be June. That's true. That's and true. So by turning them, I I kind of propagate their death faster, um, and yeah. they will break down into the soil faster. But I still may be planting. So I will I will manually turn them with a shovel and just turn them over. Um, I, I will have some of that ryegrass or clover kind of st still in clumps in my garden, and I will just over time pull those clumps out like I would a particular weed, turn them upside down they'll eventually break, or I'll put them in my compost pile. If there's a really a lot of them, I'll put them in a compost bin. So so every once in a while, them. those are called green manure crops too. Yes. So yeah. like, you, like you do just for manure, you till it down in. Yeah. And some of those cover crops do have an added benefit. They are nematode traps. True. So some nematodes will go into a plant, but they can't come out of the plant until they have completed a life cycle. So if you break it by killing the plant, you've killed that nematode as well, but not all nematodes work that way. Right. Looks like we have an in-person question, Rich. So when it's asked, can you go ahead and repeat it? Somebody else had a question? Had... Uh, I'll ask a question. Yes, ma'am. So we just moved into a new house. Mm -hmm. with, um, garden, like the bed garden that had been totally neglected. Right. It was full of weeds. Is there any ease? Can I dig them and turn them over and let them sit there for a while? Or do I need to actually pull out the weeds, dispose of them? I mean, I just want to get it in order. I don't need to plant those beds this year. I could let it. Right. So, so the question was, I've got, I moved into a new place that has beds, but there's a lot of weeds in it. And that will happen here, right? Even if you just let your bed sit for a while, the, the, um, the chickweed, all sorts of weeds that do really, really well here in this part of North Carolina will just cover over everything. Bermuda grass, centipede grass spreads into your beds. It's horrible. Um, you do not want to try to turn, just turn those weeds over because you're keeping that either the root structure or the seed structure still alive. You wanna pull them out, dispose of those weeds, not compost them, but dispose of them. Um, I do know some people that do weeds and put them in like plastic bags and kind of sterilize them in the sun. Um, that's a bit overkill for me, a little more work than I like to do. Um, but, but weeds should not go into the compost. You should get rid of them, remove them out of the garden as much as you can. Some weeds are gonna be more challenging because they've got very large root structures. And when you pull the weed, you're gonna break some of that root structure. So it's still there, uh, but you wanna pull the base of the plant as much as you can. Um, it may be, and particularly if you don't wanna use the bed for a while, a use for an herbicide, um, right? And whether you use an organic herbicide or not so organic herbicide, that's another way of trying to control that. There are some cases, and this is where in some of the gardens that I work with, that's let a little asterisk about there's some non-organic things that we do. Um, sometimes weed control, there's just sometimes no way around not using something like a Roundup, a, a total killer that will kill it. Now, again, you've got to watch. And then we, when we do use those types of controls, we're very careful about what we're, where we use it, when we spray it, what we spray it on. 
We're not spraying it typically on any of the vegetables or in the beds or in the crops. But in some cases, if we have to, a really bad problem, um, we, we will not use that bed for like six months or a year. We let that bed rest. Um, things that other things that you can use to do control. And I didn't talk about this when we talk about cover crops, but another reason I use cover crops is for exactly that reason to keep the weeds down. If I have beds in my garden that I'm not using during the winter time, if I just let them sit without anything in it, they're going to get covered with weeds. If I plant a cover crop like clover or annual ryegrass or a mix, many cases, I, that's taking the bed up. It's keeping, it's choking the weeds out, particularly the ryegrass gets really, really thick. The weeds have no way of growing. So, so I keep that bed from being a weed mess in the springtime. So I will do that uh, as, as a way of controlling that. And then in many cases, you know, as I, as I do turn my bed, I will propagate some of those seeds from under the soil up. I do use a mulch. So when I'm planting tomatoes and peppers, I'm using a newspaper mulch or wood chip mulch. And I'm using that to help control those weeds. It helps control the moisture and helps keep um, a lot of the soil borne diseases from splashing up. But I use it also as weed control. Uh, because like I said, I hate weeding. It's like the bane of my gardening existence. And it's one of the things that I, I, I do by using mulch to help control those weeds. So that's another option too, planting, but using a mulch to keep the weeds under control. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, but when you turn over those cover crops, aren't you yes. exposing the weeds? Yes, so the question is, question. is when I turn over the cover crops, am I not exposing the weeds that, the, the seed weeds that are underneath there? Yes, I am. Um, and potentially I am mixing, if particularly if there were some weed in with that, I'm mixing that weed back into the soil. That's just one of the things I have to deal with, right? So it's a case of, I've got to get rid of that cover. I've got to kill the cover crop because I need to plant in two weeks. I need to prepare that bed and that soil. I really don't have much choice, but I'm not doing a whole lot of tilling. I'm trying to just turn that so that I minimize the disruption of the soil and the microbes uh, and the good things that are in the soil. And I'll minimize the amount of weeds that I'm bringing back up to the soil again, but I am, I am turning that over so that I, that I get those cover crops now breaking down quickly, quicker and faster than waiting till June till they die. Um, so, but yeah, it's a trade-off that you have to deal with. I, I'm, I'm trying to minimize impact, but I still have to deal with something with those cover crops. So. Thing on the weed idea, do we, how do you feel about the, um, Weed fabric, we have that everywhere. Yeah, so, so you know, a lot of people look at that weed fabric. That's the problem with I have with the weed fabric. And there are some people do it. And I know a lot of commercial farmers will use some type of a plastic or a weed fabric. Um, it doesn't typically let moisture down into the soil. Um, so if it's raining outside, it, so you have to have an irrigation system. Um, it it um eventually gets, you know, I've used it in some other garden beds and things, and, and it becomes an impenetrable surface too. Um, I'm not a real big fan of that. I prefer something that's more organic that will break down. So like newspaper will break down quickly for one, one season, the newspaper breaks down and, and it turns right into, it's more carbon that gets put right into the soil as I turn that newspaper over from year to year. Um, I prefer not to use that. Some people do. And in some cases where your weeds are absolutely completely out of control, it might be one option. Um, again, not everything is perfect for every situation. So it could be something that you would use. I just don't like it because it doesn't let the water penetrate down through it. Even though it may look like it's got holes, it becomes an impenetrable barrier. So, so other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, on tomatoes, um, your, your crop rotation chart, that's great for somebody who's growing all different kinds of things. Sure. My husband will only eat tomatoes and peppers. Right. Period. Right. So how often can I grow tomatoes and peppers in, in that soil? Sure. Um, can you repeat that question for the online yes. audience? Yeah. So the question is, is all I want to grow is tomatoes and peppers. If I want to do crop rotation, that's really tough to do. In if I'm only growing one family of plants. Um, Two things I would have for that as a suggestion. And, and I have very limited this space. space. Yeah, little limited space. So I don't like I can't do five other beds. Yeah. Um, well, so technically farmers, their rotation is supposed to be for tomatoes every seven years. Yeah. As homeowners, we can't do that, obviously, right? We don't have that much space. We don't have a big field to do that. Um, 
what I might do is grow peppers on one side and tomatoes on the other and kind of switch back and forth. Um, I would, during the off season, grow a cover crop that, again, might help bring more nutrients into that soil. Um, do your soil tests more frequently to see what nutrients are being pulled out of that. Again, although we don't pull measure nitrogen per se, some of the other things would be very important to measure. Um, calcium, magnesium, and other things that are in there, that would be good. Um, Container could be another way of doing it or changing your soil. I mean, one of the one of the things and problems we have seen more cases of nematodes here, uh, the not good nematodes in the soil, causing root knot nematode on things like tomatoes and peppers. Uh, you pull your plant up and there's all these little nodules at the end of the roots. Your plant is really in bad shape. Uh, that's an example of a root knot nematode. Typically, they were only in warmer climates like Florida and Georgia and in the deep south. We're seeing it more up here as our temperatures get warmer. Um, about the only solution you have for some of those things is also replace your soil. So I know that's, that's, that's a challenge if I got an eight by 12 bed or how do I replace my soil, but that may be something you have to do every few years to, if you've got a serious problem. Can um, just add new soil on top? Um, you can, but, but, it, but diseases like blights and things that are in the soil that will be a problem for you um, is, is going to stay in that soil. Eventually, those disease that, those, those funguses and um, bacteria are going to get in there. Um, containers is another way of doing it, right? So there you have a smaller or you can change and rotate that. Um, the squirrels eat everything. The yeah. Right. Covered on the top to keep the squirrels, rabbits, deer, bulls, everything sure. else. And I can't do that. Yeah, and it, and and it, and sometimes those that that pests don't scale, right? You can't you can't scale and support that. But that's another option. Um, there is um, soilless growing of uh, like hay bale growing. Um, I will say hay bale growing takes a lot of preparation of that hay bale. Um, I know some people that have serious tomato soil problems. That's one way they do it. They grow it without soil um, and in, in a hay bale, but it takes a lot of preparation months ahead of time to prepare the bed. The, 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 um, and, and then I've personally found when we've grown that, it's still a challenge. There's a lot more fertilizer and things that you have to use on it. Um, it the plants don't grow as well, but it's another option that you're dealing with soilless um, growing. So it is possible to grow hydroponically. Um, certain things grow better like lettuces and things like that more hydroponically than things like tomatoes, but there's possibility. Um, there are people that grow that too. And that's another option too. Um, but you're, it, a lot of those things as alternatives are going to take more time, potentially more money. Um, may have more chemical related hydroponics, take a fair amount of chemicals to do, um, that do it effectively, um, maybe more cost than, uh, so that, that, that $5 tomato is, is maybe a $25 tomato, but it's the, it's the love of growing it. So yes, man, you had a question. Oh, Okay. All right. So that was just a comment that was made up is, is I've talked about the extension master gardener handbook. Um, Wake County libraries have those in their libraries, 15 copies available. So if you want to check those out and look at the physical book, um, those are available through Wake County library. Thank you. Thank you for that reference. Uh, again, that is also available online and available for purchase. Uh, if you want that handbook that we as master gardeners use uh, for, for our training and such. So. We're going a little long with the questions, Rich, but if you have more time, there's still some more in the online. All right, I'll take a few more. Okay. And, and uh, here's a, a quick one from Bev. She was wondering what the size of that uh, sample garden with the warm, cool was that you showed. Oh, the size of it's fairly the... early on. She was wondering if it was like four by eight, which it probably was just because of board sizes. I don't remember if I had sizes listed. Yeah, yeah. So, so this size. Um, this one, I think these are eight foot squares. So one, two, three, yeah, it's four foot by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Looks like this is four by 12. Um, 
And, and this particular one has kind of one foot squares. If you can see on the back, you may not be able to see it, but on the back side underneath there, it's kind of looking like that. Um, so this is kind of the layout of that tomato. That's That looks almost like a three foot square uh, for the tomato plant. Uh, we recommend, or I recommend whenever I have people building beds that you try to stick to the size of lumber as it comes in the store. Um, it's a lot easier and a less weight. So something with a dividable, like an eight foot dividable and half would be good, 10 foot or 12 foot lengths or eight foot lengths for the beds, just to avoid waste. Um, look at look at eight foot, 10 foot, 12 foot. Those are the standard lengths that are available in hardware stores. Um, Thank you, Rich. And uh, Val has an interesting question here and I know the answer, but I'm gonna have you answer it because I think everyone should hear um, from the official speaker. Uh, let's see where she is. Uh, she's growing cherry tomatoes and uh, in, in a container, and she's wondering if you can prune the tips out to reduce the plant's overall size since they can get rather big. Yeah, so so growing tomatoes are very interesting. Um, two types of tomatoes that typically we see out there, um, determinate and indeterminate. Determinate varieties are ones that have a, have a determinate height and determinate fruiting, means they fruit one time, indeterminate basically are like vines and they will grow forever and they produce fruit pretty much all season long. Um, varieties that are determinate typically are ones that you see like Roma tomatoes. A lot of those plum type of tomatoes are determinate varieties. They have a fixed height and fixed flowering um, and, and fruit propagation. The indeterminate are not. So yes, you can absolutely keep your tomato heights down uh, particularly if you're growing in containers. I would also look into um, suckering those. So as you see, most tomatoes will create, and the indeterminate varieties will create a sucker between the stalk um, and the branch, and they'll try to grow more stalks. You can sucker those or trim those back, cut those out in between that to keep the shape of your tomato. Um, th there are some whole great publications about tomato growing uh, at, through NC State and through Extension Service. Reach out to the master gardeners, ask for tomato information, and we can get you information about that. The types of varieties, types that do well, ones that are disease resistant. Um, there's also then hybrid varieties that are partly determinate, partly indeterminate. Um, there are also special varieties like Patio Princess, which is a really, really short tomato variety that stays short, is great for containers, great for patios, a very good producer for, for, for that small type of space. I would uh, add that when you're pruning, keep in mind that the flowers are coming on the new growth. Co correct. So you will at least at best be reducing the time, or not reducing the time, but increasing the time for flowering, again, to make more fruit because you've just removed what's making the flower. Right, that's true. So, so I think definitely the um, smaller ones would probably be recommended for a container because they do get big. Yeah, tomatoes can get very large. Um, my father-in-law used to not do any kind of trellising, would plant them on the ground in his farm and just let them run. And they literally run 10, 20, 30 feet on the ground on black plastic. So, um, but, but again, people grow those differently. Some like to sucker, some don't like to sucker. I prefer, I have limited space. I want to produce the most amount of fruit and the strongest plant. Um, I prefer to sucker my tomatoes. Great. And uh, here's here's another one. And maybe this would be the point we stop because it is getting a little bit long. I think you have somewhere to go. Um, Carolyn was wondering, um, the resources you're talking about, uh, obviously, are Wake County related resources. She's wondering if she's they're very available in Orange County. Um, so, so yes, so these, these resources are available. I'm, I'm a Wake County Master Gardener. Uh, we do have Master Gardeners in almost every major county here. Um, I keep going backwards here. Um, any of these resources available online are available to anybody. Most of them will be applicable this center part of North Carolina. So Orange County, um, in any in this area, these resources and the information is applicable. Um, where it becomes a little less applicable in terms of timeline are, are when you get more towards the mountains or towards the coast, where you get a completely different environments and growing and timelines. But there are master gardeners available in Orange County also. So you can reach out to that or reach out to our master gardeners to see where the contacts are in Durham, Orange County, if you're in other parts of the state. Even out of the state. Or even out of the state yep. too, yeah. So, I mean, there's extension services across the entire country. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are master gardeners and extension services available almost anywhere in the country. 
um, that you can have access to. And again, there's there's some, and I should have put the the national extent master gardener because there are some national master gardener national pages that can tie you to exactly to the extension service and the master gardeners that are available in your state and your location. It's probably hard to say that they're all available to everyone across the entire world. There's probably some publication somewhere that's locked down. True, but that's this is true. extension. The, the idea behind it is to get the information out to the public. So this is all freely available on the web and in publication and with great resources like you going out to the public and talking and the videos and everything. Great. Okay. We're trying to disseminate information, not lock it down. Right. That's And that's exactly our purpose is to get that information from the universities out to the field. We're those volunteers that extend that information out to the field. So, yeah. Well, that's right. like a very good place to stop. Thank you so much, Rich, for being here today. We really appreciate it. And everyone, we hope to see you again. We offer the Master Gardener Lectures once a month, except for during November and December because the holidays get in the way. So I hope we'll see you again in April. Great. Thank see you all, you all very later. much. Thanks, Rich. Have a good day.